Open your Bibles to Jeremiah 18, verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred. in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me. I'll have more to say about that tonight concerning verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, I want you to personalize this tonight. Put your name, my name there, O oh, whoever you are. I'm putting my name in there tonight. O oh, Joe, can I not do you with, as this potter? Saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are ye in my hands. Instead of O house of Israel, just insert your name as I have mine. Personalize it tonight. Now, to quickly, if you go to the board... The potter, obviously, is God or the Lord Jesus. The clay is us. The process is to make something desirable, useful, and valuable. And of course, then I took us in different direction. All the steps in the, or of the process that the potter takes from the beginning to the finished product. Choosing the clay, not that this finished product will be done, because I'm a work in progress and so are you. And we might become marred on occasions. But God knows where he left off and how to mend this broken pot, if need be. But I'll get to that in a minute. Choosing the clay, he went down to the horrible pit of the noisy pit. We looked at Psalms 40 and other places. Preparing the clay, one of the processes by cleansing of the, the clay with water, Centering the clay, we also looked at Kuhn and how he establishes our goings back to Psalms 40, verse 2. Now, these messages are in the archives now in the teaching center. If you missed it, there's five other messages before this message. And centering the clay, the process is for keeping us centered on Christ. So we have to be Christ-centered instead of, instead of, instead of self-centered. And last time I preached on this subject, we went to the shaping of the clay and the pressure that's applied, upward and outward. And tonight, keep it on the board, we're going to talk about, we're going to preach about, we're going to put this on the board. Well, let's put it right here. Fire. Fire. Quite frankly, Honestly, I was done with the shaping and pressure. Now you're telling me I'm going to have to be thrown into the fire? Also, this is not some hoorah message. If you really think about it, this part is, and even this part. And even this ain't so bad. If you're willing to be an obedient servant of Jesus Christ and turn your life over to him and let him center you. But the shaping and pressure, now the fire? Now you're getting to areas that are not very attractive. It won't draw that many Christians into the fold. Or many or any or many future true disciples of Jesus Christ. Into the fold of being a true servant of Jesus Christ. Well, that may be, may be true in today's Christian world, but it's not necessarily true if you understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The fire. Once you are formed, once you are shaped by the right amount and masterful hands of the potter and a right amount of pressure, you have a shaped vessel, but it's not done.
And if it becomes marred, it might have to be reshaped again and then throw again back into the fire. Throw it again back in the fire. Like I said, this is a work in progress. The way these shaped vessels become hardened, and you'll see that through all of Scripture, is through trials. Tried by the fire. If a pot doesn't get thrown into the fire, it will not stand up to normal usage. And I know the different ways of drying clay. But back into the time period when this was written for our instruction today, you have to apply what Jeremiah was caused to hear and see. But here, faith comes by hearing you hear the word of God through God's words, through the example of the potter and the clay in the potter's house. It will not stand up to normal usage. Forget even anything that's strenuous. Fire takes that clay, that raw clay vessel, even though it's shaped, and it makes it become stable. Forever what purpose or desire, useful purpose or desire, the master's hands of the potter intended it to be. Now, in the days of Jeremiah, clay was hardened three different ways. It was not just one way and everybody followed it. No. Clay was hard in three different ways. The first, you might want to write this down. You can dry out the form of vessel that you created by just putting it out in the sun. Let it air dry. That was the simplest way, the easiest way, but it didn't create a durable product. In fact, of all the three ways I'll mention tonight, it was the least durable way of stabilizing that vessel that was formed by the potter. Even though it was the simplest and fastest, not the fastest, but the easiest way, it was not the most stable way, the most durable way. When put into even normal usage, you could depend it to last. Forget anything strenuous. The second, write this down also. You could bake it in the oven. Is it was not as durable as a kiln fire clay process, but it was more durable than the air dry out in the sun process. In fact, the air dry process of putting it out in the sun only removed about 30% of the water that the clay still had in its contents. Now put that in the spiritual terms. You want the simplest and quickest, but not the most durable way. I could teach and Bring in the parable of the sower at this point if I wanted to, but I'm not. But the air dry way of drying out a piece of pottery or a vessel of whatever sort out in the sun, it only removed 30% of the water. I want to put a spiritual understanding of that. The shortcuts only produce about 30% of the potential that God wants you to become for his use, useful and desirable and valuable purposes. Shortcut Christianity, if you really think about it. Let's take the easy route. Let's take the easy route. Who doesn't like to just, be, you know, who, who doesn't like to go down to the beach or sit by a poolside or in your backyard and just sit there and just absorb some of the sun rays? If that's all we had to do to be a Christian, I think we have everybody sunning up. And not too much of a turnover rate. He goes, whoopee, now that's my kind of Christian. 
enjoying the sun, lounging out in the, wherever you would lounge at, the beach or the poolside, or your backyard, or the park, or wherever you would go, and just lay there and say, you know what? It is just great being a Christian. I'm enjoying this. God is finally doing something that I like. You're only about 30% useful, and you ain't going to last very long. You're not durable in a baked oven or oven-baked way of drying out a potter vessel that he formed was more durable than air dry, but is still not something that potentially could last under stressful periods of usage. Whether it was storage, a container, for other useful purposes. Now the last one is a kiln fire type oven. I mean, those type of fiery ovens would heat up to over 2,000 degrees. Well, that's hot. That is fiery hot. But it produced the most durable, most useful product when it eventually was completed in that process. Now, if you really look at today's Christian world, we have all three types. Very few in the kiln fire, many in the air drive, air dry category, and the rest in the oven baked. Most Christianity preaches that it's okay to be in the air dry or the oven bake. fire process of producing a disciple, a true disciple of Jesus Christ. I can't find it nowhere in Scripture where a true disciple of Jesus Christ doesn't have to be kiln-baked, let's just call it that. Isn't that the word is spelled K-I-L-N? The first three letters of the first three letters of the word in the English language kill. <laughs> Believe me, sometimes you think you're going to be done in when you're in that type of fire, when that type of heat is turned on. Now, vessels, whatever you've been shaped or formed to be for Christ's purposes, only reach that fire phase if you have submitted, you have yielded to the shaping, to the surrendering. You have surrendered to the hand of the potter. If you didn't, you wouldn't even get this far, folks. But you do, if you do, the trial, or let's call it the heat, is part of the process. You just can't pick one, step one, or the first one there on the board, on the bottom, choosing the clay. You can't just pick preparing the clay. You just can't pick pick, pick setting the clay to be Christ-centered. Or the shaping of the fire. To be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you're going to have to go through all of it. And when you get to the fire stage, don't settle for 30%. Don't buy into this, there's an easier way to be a Christian and you can have all the pleasures in life that you want. You might get that. I'm not saying you won't, but don't expect it. True disciples of Jesus Christ, go through the fire. I mean, you go to 1 Peter chapter 4, been there many times. 
You go there quickly. I won't stay there long, but you can go there if you want. Starting with verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange. Don't think it's strange. You can be thrown into the fire. And anything that came before it, the shaping, the pressure, the turning your life, surrendering your life over where you're not fighting the master to center you, none of those things. But when you get to the fire, behold, may be love. And think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. The fiery trial. Which is to try you. The fiery trial which is to try you. To see if you're going to stand up to the, not just the normal usage, but the strenuous usage, whatever vessel Christ formed you to be useful for his purposes. Period. He's going to try you. As, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange thing happened to you. Don't be surprised by it. Don't be surprised. Don't get be shocked. Don't get angry. Don't get mad at God. But rejoice. Wow, man, rejoice. But rejoice. Now, that's hard to do sometimes. I got to admit. Believe me. This last month, there's a few things to rejoice about if I just look at my circumstances in the flesh, not through God and His Word. And the instructions that's given to me to not only prepare me for what I already knew was coming in some circumstances, but when it does get here, rejoice. He's seeing if you could last the heat of the fire because he has something in mind for you to be put to useful a useful purpose for his glory. That's why it says, but rejoice, inasmuch as ye are particulars of Christ, that means that ye, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. In a sense, you're not just going this, through this because he's trying to produce a vessel that's desirable, useful, and valuable, but it also is going to bring him glory. Rejoice because it's going to bring him glory. Rejoice because the fire, the heat of the trial is going to bring, or the furnace is going to bring him glory. 2 Corinthians. Since I'm on this particular subject right now, might as well just jump across or jump back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's just start with verse 7, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. It could also be translated, we have these treasures in jars of clay. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side. You can also translate that we are pressed on every side. In some translations, you don't even see hard pressed. We are pressed on every side. Yeah. We are being shaped. We are being pressured. But with, if it's pressure from, from God, it's under his masterful hands. And he's know what he, he knows what he's doing. I said that last time. He knows the exact amount of pressure, not only to expand the capacity of your, remember, heart, but your usefulness. Which, by the way, we should rejoice and be glad in it because it brings him glory. We are pressed on every side, yet not distressed or not crushed. Not crushed. God knows what he's doing. But there's times that we all take stupid pills and we become marred. And we don't think we know what he's doing. We, put, we take things in our own hands. And what happens? In the pottery world, 
the pot would get cracked, even broken, and even shattered. But be not in despair. Yet not distressed, excuse me, not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Literally, not altogether without help. Why? Because the potter's there. Persecuted, but not forsaken or abandoned. Cast down or struck down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. Just think about it. I have to remind myself that this at times. Are you rejoicing? Are you understanding that the potter has you in his hands? I go to so many other promises in God's word concerning these particular, this, this particular subject tonight. But I think you understand. Once you're in the potter's hands, if we don't become self-centered again and think that we have a better way of finishing the product ourselves, guess what? or you're not led to believe by some phony baloney preacher out there that preaches a different way that really produces a 30% Christian like I mentioned earlier, he's not going to desert us. This is the promise we have. The treasure in jars of clay, us, to show that this is all surpassing Power is from God. And it's not from us. And anything that we're going to go through, whether it's being pressed on every side or whatever, He's going to be there right along with us. Because he, it brings Him glory also. To see that He produced a pot that will be useful and will be valuable for his purposes and is desirable because he can see that that mic is falling that the pot will be able to withstand anything and everything beyond just normal usage Strenuous, strenuous usage too. God took this mold, this clay, me or you. So I said to personalize this. Personalize this. He molded us and fired us in the furnace of the fire. He took this original glob of clay, which. As it goes through these processes, as a work of progress in motion, it's too bad we can't film our life to see where we've been, where we're at now, and God knows where we're going to be at in the future. We probably could not even recognize ourselves anymore. Why? Because we are changed. We're in the process of being changed. Something for the better desirability of Christ, for what he's, his intentions are for me and for you. We are changed. Why? Because if you take the Old Testament concept you see so often, when you look at the tabernacle and the temple and everything involved in it, nothing changes in the New Testament. We are here. He's forming this vessel for two purposes, to serve and to lift him up in worship. That was the concept he was trying to teach through the tabernacles and the 
all the furnishings and everything that went with that in the Old Testament. And also when it was not just a tent any longer, and a tent and a temple was made by Solomon. It was for people to find their place in the ministry to serve and to lift up, not only in the, in the ministry, but in their personal life, lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, or God, in the Old Testament, in worship. Horizontally, in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, we see that to serve means that we horizontally serve one another. We horizontally serve when we bring the word rightly divided to some other individual that never even heard of it. Or if they heard of the word of God, they might have been taught some squirrely way that God knows what they were taught. And then even now, under the tutelage of someone that's rightly dividing the word of God, was this ministry or someone else? So you got that horizontal relationship going, but you also have a vertical where we find ourselves worshiping and, and lifting our voices and our service to God also. The vessels just not to sit there and look at, to look pretty. It has a purpose. Since I'm in the New Testament, go to Matthew. Verse 10, no, chapter 4, verse 10. Matthew chapter 4, 4 verse 10. I'm just going to read this verse because I don't have time to read. This is when Jesus is being tempted by the devil, and he wraps it up by saying, Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, after going through all the temptation that Satan threw at him, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Even then... Christ is telling them to worship the Lord thy God. And him only shalt thou serve. Makes you wonder what Christ was even hoping back for Satan after being tempted. Yes, he's quoting back in Deuteronomy chapter 6, but then said Jesus to him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. Get out of here, Satan, because you know it's written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Do I think Satan would say, Okay, I want to repent and worship only God now and serve him only and stop being self-centered and thinking that I could be a God also? No, I really don't. But, God, but the, the Lord Jesus is reminding Satan what God said way back in the Old Testament. You to worship the Lord God, and in Him only shall thou serve. So the purpose of this vessel not only is horizontally, but vertically. Like I mentioned earlier, we have to serve one another, and not some of the ways that you find other ministries proclaiming what that service is. But we also here to worship God. You see that concept through all of Scripture, from Old to New Testaments. Now, that's just kind of an introduction where we're going to go to, really, tonight. So back to Jeremiah 18, and I have to hurry because, like I said, I don't know how long I can sit here tonight because of this physical ailment I have. But I want to get back to, you got that concept down? Let me jump back now to Jeremiah 18, verse 4. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel and seemed good to the potter to make it. Or he returned and made it, literally. Some things do go wrong. Even after that vessel is made and it's put into useful, valuable purpose, That vessel can become broken. Nobody wishes that. Nobody hopes for that. I pray always that our faith fail not. But it can't be dropped. If you look at it, normal pottery, it can't be dropped. You put some spiritual significance on that, you can drop away from following the Lord and start following afar off just as Peter did just before he denied his Lord. 
you become cracked. You get chipped. And sometimes, because the gift ministries are supposed to prepare the hearers of faith that do want to follow Christianity, I mean follow Jesus, in the Christian faith, they're not prepared. So there's not enough preparation. They're only air-baked or oven-baked. And they will be able to handle the stress. And they won't have the ability to hold together because they were not tried by the fire or in the fire. I've seen too many of those in my lifetime, more than I would like to even think about. I mean, you can even convince yourself. You're hanging out in the right type of fire. Boy, have I seen so many of those. You think about it. You go to Luke. Do some Bible traveling tonight. You go to Luke chapter 22, since I'm mentioning Peter in this message. Might as well continue in that same thought tonight, using Peter as example. you got some Christians think they're being tried by the fire. Or they're, they're in the right type of fire, but they're not. What do you mean? Well, first of all, they're not rightly divided, taught the rightly divided word of God, and their fires explain some way besides what I'm preaching to you tonight. Forget a fiery furnace. They're not even a match. And a physical match where you light a match to create a little, a matchstick to create a little fire. We're not even talking about that type of heat. They're not being prepared, folks. And then there's a case, some cases where you are prepared, just like Peter was. But he still dropped, was dropped. He caused himself to be dropped. He boasted he had a big mouth. He said, Lord, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll never deny you, really. No matter what happens. And what happened to Peter? As soon as Jesus was a prisoner and he went to trial. You read the story. This is someone you can see clearly hanging out in the wrong type of fire. You look at Luke chapter 22, verse 54. This is... Peter's denial of Jesus. You can find it in all the gospel records. Then they took they him and led him and brought him to the high priest's house. That's Jesus, that is. And Peter followed afar off. He was not going to be side by side with his Lord. Even though he proclaimed that he's there till the end. And this was someone instructed and trained by Jesus Christ. But even Peter became broken. Not because of the Lord's doing, because of his doing. And the first thing he did was he followed afar off. At any time in this period of time, in that, that moment, that's when he should be pressing in closer than ever. But he followed afar off. And you read it here in the story. And Peter followed afar off, verse 54. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, all the interested onlookers, I guess, and were sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Now, but a certain maid beheld him, and he sat by the fire, and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, after... After another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another, confidently affirming, saying, 
of a truth, this fellow also was with them, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. You don't know what you're talking about. You got me mixed up with some other guy. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. In verse 55 and 56, he was hanging out all right, and he sat by a fire. But he chose a worldly fire. He chose a fire that didn't put him in the heat of the furnace. And then went on to deny his Lord. And the finished result at this time was he ran out and he wept bitterly. He was, a, he was broken in the trial, in the heat of the trial, concerning his faithfulness at Jesus' trial, of all places. He declared that he was going to be faithful. He declared he was going to be there till the end. But was he? No, he wasn't. What he actually did, he substituted the, the, the trial fire where Jesus was at for the world's fire to stay warm. Far enough away from Jesus, but to stay warm. He put himself in a cozier position. He could see Jesus. He may not necessarily could hear what was going on, but he could see Jesus from his position and stay warm at the same time. How many Christians have I come across in my lifetime? All they're doing is falling from afar off. They're convincing themselves that they're in the heat of the fire, the heat of the trial with Jesus. Because if you're in it, Jesus is there also if you're a true disciple of Jesus Christ. But they're not. They're in a worldly fire. They're in a fire which is afar off from where Jesus is at. And he substituted the trial fire for the world fire. And convinced himself it was okay. And that's what so many Christians have done. I've heard people say, well, I have so many trials and tribulations, I'm going to get into heaven. Well, you know what? The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. What's new? That is no guarantee of entrance to heaven. What happened? Peter went away running. Peter went away weeping. What happened? He cracked. He cracked. But thank God that's not the end of the story. Because he also was restored. He was restored by the second firing. I want you to stop and really think about it. He was restored by a second firing. You go to John. I've preached on this before, not necessarily using this example, but you go to John chapter 21. This is where Jesus appears in Galilee. And Simon Peter said unto them, other disciples, I go a fishing. Literally meaning that he was going to go back. And he was taking some disciples with him, including the beloved disciple, with him. I go back to my original occupation. So, what it means there in the original language is I'm going to go back to what I did before I met Jesus. This following Jesus, this wonderful dream that we have, no longer exists. So he even really, if you think about it, started even following even further away. They said unto him, we also go with thee. He had some willing disciples to go with him. And they went forth and entered the ship immediately, and that night they, called, they caught nothing. I'm in Jeremiah 21, verse 3. 
But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast them on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of the fishes. Therefore the disciple who Jesus loved said unto Peter, John, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fishers coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. He even wait till the boat got back. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. And of course, you know the rest of the story. Christ now goes into a restoring mode and say, no. You're not going back to your original occupation any longer. You're not going to back to being a fisherman of fishes. You're going to be a fisherman of men and the disciples that were with him. And of course, he had to convince Peter this three times. He asked him, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. And I'm not going to get into all that right now. And then he finally gets Peter on board. And Peter was restored. Remember, after Jesus was resurrected, he gave the instructions, go tell my disciples and Peter. Christ knew that that vessel that was being formed cracked under the heat of the fire. Why? Because he was pressing close to the wrong type of fire. He was pressing and hanging around a worldly fire, not the fire that we all need to be shaped in, that Christ provides, that Christ allows in our life to produce something that's stable, something that can handle the stress of whatever comes our way. Peter was restored, but he was restored by the second fire. And of course, Christ used his whole example to bring Peter back into the fold and restored him. How are cracked vessels stored in those days? Restored, excuse me. This is something that most people you probably never even heard of. Going back to Jeremiah 18, if a pot be became cracked, for whatever reason, even if it was put in through a kiln fire type of oven. If it became crack, you know what they used to use? They used to use the blood of an insect, something like a tick. It was called a fasuka. Now these, these ticks, like bugs, used to cling on to like the back of oxen or bulls and goats. And they would pull these ticks from these animals and the potter would squeeze these, blood, these bugs and they drop the blood onto a dried type of powder into, and, made a, into, and then made a paste of it. And then they would apply this paste to the crack in the vessel. And then he would refire the vessel and repeat this motion till all the cracks were filled and repaired and the vessel made strong again. Jeremiah 18. It might become marred, but guess what? The potter's not through with you. He's going to throw you back into the fire. And the vessel the vessel that he made, verse 4, Jeremiah 18, was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Now let me just read to you, I've got a note here, about what I just explained to you. The potter prepared a certain kind of cement out of blood from a small insect, 
which lived in the body of a bull, a goat, so forth. The potter would take the blood of this insect and mix it with powder, broken pottery and cement the crack in the vessel. So it became like a cement. The power of the blood to fix the broken pottery would mend the cracks. <laughs> what blood mend us? What blood restored us? What blood repaired us? The blood of our Savior Jesus Christ, folks. Let me read you the description. He would put more wet clay on it, reheat it, refire it, and if it held the patch, it was called, guess what it was called? A vessel of mercy. A vessel of mercy. Isn't that what Christ has done for us? And if we become marred, we run back to him? Guess what? He'll patch us up. The spilling of his blood promises that, us that. And we become a vessel of mercy. A vessel of mercy was used to carry, by the way, fresh water that was freely shared with strangers. So once that mended by the blood, in this case of an insect, our case, by the, our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. It was to carry water. Let's just substitute, in a spiritual sense, water for the Word of God. Living epistles. And supporting the ones that proclaim it, rightly divided. That was to be freely shared with strangers. With strangers. What a wonderful message if you think about it. When you're cracked, I only have one message for you. Apply the blood of Jesus Christ. When you're cracked, when you need a repair, when you need to be restored, you need to apply the blood of the Jesus, Jesus Christ. I mean, you go to 1 John. I was not going to go there. I'm going to go there. Chapter 1. This sums up just about everything I just said about the blood. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood restores, the blood repairs, the blood mends, the blood saves. Apply the blood of Jesus Christ, folks. If you don't, you'll find yourself in a situation. Oh, you might be thinking you're a Christian. You might be thinking you're hanging around the right type of fire and going through the right type of fire. But I guarantee you, you'd be just like Peter in a situation he was. He was in a cozy fire that was doing him no good. And the more, longer he stayed there, the further he created a distance from him and his Lord Jesus Christ. But thank God we have a Savior who died for us, and he wants to apply the blood to mend us, no matter what's happened to us in our past. He's there to mend us, repair us, restore us. He's given us that second firing Opportunity. And the same message hold true to be a desirable, useful, and valuable vessel or servant of Jesus Christ 
for whatever purpose and the capacity he has you doing it in. Whether you like it or not, you're going to have to be in the right fire, the kiln fire, the spiritual kiln fire, even though it might be very hot. But it's a type of fire that produces a durable, lasting, one that can handle the strenuous trials and afflictions ahead, vessel that Christ wants you and myself to be. That's what's desirable to Him. That's what's useful to Him. And that's what's valuable to Him. And who we, are we to say how the potter is going to continue finishing this work in progress? Who are we to say? O house of Israel, O whatever your name is, can I not do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine. O oh, whatever your name is tonight. You can fill that in. He has chosen you. He has prepared you. He has centered you. He has shaped you in pre with the pressure that he has applied. And he's put you through the fire. So you can be tried, tested. Because he wants vessels that can handle the strenuous trials and afflictions ahead because it brings him glory. So rejoice over it. Wimps for Jesus need not to apply. Now, I don't care what your circumstances are. And don't tell me, well, I'm going through so much, I must be going to heaven. I'm sure there's a lot of people, including Peter, that was sitting by that fire while Jesus was not too far in the distance being tried and is being tried with one result, really. I don't even know why it was tried, because they wanted to murder him. They wanted to eliminate his life. And Peter and the rest of the disciples should have been there standing with them, but they weren't. But we have a forgiving Lord. We have a Lord that will take a crack pot, a marred pot, and reshape it again, and mend it and repair it, and put it right back in the fire. Just because he repaired you and restored you doesn't mean you're not going to go back in the fire. I can guarantee you tonight, who are we to talk back to the potter? Romans 9.21, remember we were there last time. Who are we? They're just picking up on the same principle as Jeremiah 18. Had not the power, power, power and authority over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel to honor another unto dishonor? Who's the boss? He is. So whatever your name is, he's going to do with, with you what he wants you to, what he wants to do with you. As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand. You're in God's hands. Remember that. Remember, from the pit that you were dug, in, dug from, all the way to the fire, that you're being tested and tried to see if your faith will be more precious than gold that is tried in the fire. I believe you don't follow far off. And even if you slip, run to Jesus. He'll fire you up again because his blood, just like that insect, but a billion, trillion, zillion times better, can mend and repair your life and put you back in fellowship with him, pressing in close and not afar off. You get it, folks? You get it? Now, I'm pretty much concluded for now these messages in the discipleship series on the potter's house. But I'll be coming back to it. I'm not done. But I think I've given you enough information for you to digest that for a while. To remember, and to hear with your own ears, because faith come by hearing, just as Jeremiah had to do, that was instructed in the very first verse in Jeremiah 18. 
to get the spiritual message that would be important and how the potter in this case relates to God and we are the clay and the process is everything that I just said and it's a work in progress and we're not done until we graduate he takes us home or comes back for us you got it folks rejoice it's going to get hot play the song <laughs>